Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chet, episode 523, featuring an interview with the Space Quest historian. Yes, Mr. Trolls is on. I talk all about Space Quest. Uh, he also knows a lot about other Sierra games and Lucasfilm games. A lot of uh, great adventure game uh, videos and coverage that he offers. And he knows a lot about the music as well. He's a musician who... Uh, <laughs> helps to bring a lot of these uh, soundtracks to vinyl uh, with his band. It's really cool stuff. Uh, plus, just a really groovy dude. Uh, I had a lot of fun chatting with him. I, th I think you'll uh, enjoy this video quite a lot. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here's the Space Quest Historian. So, Space Quest Historian. That's me, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Yeah, you do some great work, my friend. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> the, there's the, something. The list of the... You know, it seems like it, this looks different every time I, I try to pull this up. Yeah, every once in a while, I, I take a look at my uh, channel front page, and I just decide, no, no, this is all in the wrong order. And then I reorganize everything. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mess, because my channel is just a huge mess, really started out as let's plays and then it turned into something else and then it became like retrospective videos and you know there's just all sorts of junk there remakes i see you got some interviews up here too yeah yeah i got a uh, had a few uh lovely people who um didn't know who i was enough and then they sort of <laughs> jumped in on the i used to have a podcast uh with uh, a couple of mates um Gareth and, and Fred called the Backseat Designers. We did some interviews with uh, some pretty cool people. Um, um, and that was probably more where that stuff should have gone. But uh, we were sort of in between seasons, as it were. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, I see you done Scorched, Scorched Earth up there. Scorched Earth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, that was my jam when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. Well, you got kind of a costume going for that one. Uh, <laughs> uh it's a it's a it's a bit of a fake out uh, i think I, I found some uh military uniform i'm not even sure what kind of uniform and i just photoshopped my my face onto it uh, it's out uh, wow this just goes this is wow low okay. effort all Those around guy, dex murphy yeah and now we're getting into some really old old school territory <laughs> I was just trying to get a sense of how long you've been doing this. Uh, oh, uh, when's your first? Is there a way to get? I think we can. Uh, see, my first, my, my first ever video was yeah, oh, the Skaterama. It. Yeah, that was the one <laughs> on Skaterama, which was done in uh, like I had I had an evening to myself. My wife was away visiting her parents, and I. You know, I had uh, two bottles of wine going, and I was just like, "Yeah, you know what? Let's 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 record a video about the skaterama." For some reason, I was pretty drunk at the time, uh, so I like the transparent cup there. And that launched your career. Yeah, well, not really. <laughs> green screen, green mug. I don't know. Is that I actually? I I just bought a green screen. Um, it's uh, it's in the corner over there. So it's one of those like roll up fold out you things so and i'm like backed into a corner here so i can't put it up this is my bed <laughs> so I I've got, well of course you can't see it uh, i wonder if there's a way i can change the background i think i can I got, briefly you got one of my favorite backgrounds uh going on there although uh my friend brandon would pro oh there you go <laughs> nice nice and green this one uh it fits pretty nicely. And I noticed some you could even get for your chair, so it just kind of latches onto the back of your chair. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've never, I've like, uh, the, the green screen was actually not even for my YouTube videos. I, I bought it because I want to, um, well, it's just between you and me, I guess, but uh, I want to get into making my own games. I want to, since I can't draw for shit, I'm going to you know, photograph people and um, have them walk around and act and stuff like that. So I need a green screen for that. Like and also because I, I got a four-year-old son who likes, you know, it's just the magic of television, so to speak. So it, it could be a fun little toy as well. You said you got a four-year-old son, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. What 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 do they make about all this? 
<laughs> Space Quest and ah, uh, well, retro games. I mean, not a lot so far. Not, a little bit young, I guess, to really. Yeah, well, he's uh, he's he's, in, he's into he's into space. I mean, he uh, he's one of those precocious little uh, kids. He he's got the uh, order of the planets down in the solar system and uh, the dwarf planets and all that. And since he gets most of his information from YouTube, you know, being a kid who's got an iPad, you know, watches YouTube videos, so all of it's in English. So he's got yeah, he's got that whole thing down. His okay. uh, his his favorite star is Beetlejuice. I can't wait to show him the movie. <laughs> and. Uh, his favorite planet is Jupiter. Oh yeah, I was wondering how he came down, how he comes down on the whole Pluto being a planet thing. You know, that's sort of oh, he thing. loves that. There's there's tons of videos where you know Pluto's acting all sad, like I want to be a planet again. So, you no, know, you're not a planet anymore. <laughs> Just for those, like, we kind of jumped in, I guess. But you know, for those not familiar with the channel, this is the Space Quest historian. <laughs> oh, oh, we started. <laughs> yeah, I like to do that. You know. Yeah, but just, where, are you, uh, where are you from? I don't know if that's common knowledge. Or... I don't know. It's not. Uh, it's not a well kept secret or anything. But I'm. Uh, I'm from Denmark. Oh. Yeah. 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 That that, that deserves a, a drink of water. Is there, a big, sorry? is there a big Denmark scene from retro and classic games? I don't know. It's not really a big scene for anything. Uh, it's <laughs> a very very small country in Scandinavia. Uh, so I've, I mean, I've I've met a few good people who are into this sort of thing, but uh, it's not like a yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's a huge thing, but then again, it's not a lot of people here. So yeah, I've never been there. You know, of course, it looks beautiful. A lot of history, I'm sure. I'm I'm told. <laughs> I wouldn't know. No, they they probably don't want to put you on the board of tourism for. <laughs> Probably wouldn't. I, I wouldn't make a terribly good ambassador. Not really. Uh, I don't watch a lot of, of Danish movies or TV shows and stuff like that. Um, uh, I don't know our history particularly well. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm I'm Danish by birth, but that's really about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I guess you got access to a computer and all that pretty early, and all the. Oh yeah. Danish well, yeah. Oh, sorry. I keep keep cutting you off. That's a that's a terrible um, affliction of mine. Oh, um, the, uh, <laughs> you do what you like. <laughs> I should I should take my shoes off and behave like a gentleman. But uh, um, no, I, my uh, uh, my dad was really like into technology and and computers and stuff when I was growing up. So uh, very very early on, he brought home like a, a Commodore sixty four was our real first real computer. Yeah, uh, yeah. But be but before that, I mean, he had his own little lab of sorts uh, in the basement where he would just like because uh, uh, he's an electrical engineer. He was, you know, uh, circuit boards and soldering things together and stuff like that. So uh, before the Commodore 64, he built his own little like circuit board computer with a little LCD display and you could play like a rudimentary type of Wheel of Fortune thing on it. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So he was, and, and every time we had like, my brother and I, when we had any sort of computer problem, something, we'd just go running to dad and he was like, okay, what'd you do now? Oh, I spilled a glass of Coke on my keyboard. It's like, oh, fine. Here's another one. <laughs> He's actually building computers in the basement, man. That is pretty cool. He was building all sorts of weird shit. He was, he was one of those, uh, like kids in the, uh, he's, he's, he was born in 1950. So he was a, he was a teenager in the, you know, 60s early 70s and he was like building his own speakers hi-fi speakers and stuff like that and uh that's the best uh my, my my favorite thing uh was when i was a teenager like roughly like starting high school um he built his own radio transmitter in the backyard uh which uh could pump out his uh you know the output on his pc uh over fm radio so uh <laughs> 90.5 FM in Hotbeck in Denmark was my dad's computer. <laughs> wow. It covered the whole town. It's fantastically illegal. Uh, he only kept it up for like a year or so. And then he discovered, oh, it actually, that's a, that's a three-year prison sentence if anyone catches on. <laughs> you guys didn't have a DeLorean in the garage, huh? 
<laughs> no, no, but uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it against him. He had some. Uh, he had all sorts of ways. Uh, we had like a phone system in in our house where, uh, like, a little phone central. So he put, and this is landline uh, territory. So he, he put a landline phone in every room in the house. And when someone would call the house, this little switchboard he built would have every phone in the entire house ring. And whoever picked it up was, you know, the guy who took the call. But if it was like, hey, uh, this is me, uh, I want to talk to my brother. Okay, let me patch you through. Click, click. <laughs> you just, yeah, we had our own little switchboard. <laughs> well, I'm impressed. <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm still impressed with the dude. <laughs> And so is he the original Space Quest fan and you're playing games with him or how did that come about? No, interestingly, he was never really into games as such. Uh, when he brought home the Commodore 64, it was like, uh, oh, I'm going to teach myself programming. I'm, you know, this is a new thing, computers. I'm into technology and, and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to teach myself programming. And my brother and I, children, of, of course, like, what, seven or eight? And my brother's three years younger than me. And we looked at that thing and went, games? Oh, <laughs> yes. And, and he, he couldn't get near it after that. So, uh... So no, not really. But he was into the technology side of things. Like he built the, uh, uh, my brothers and I, our computers. And like he'd put the peripherals in and show us this is where the IDE cables go and all that sort of shit. And we'd like, uh, you know, buy games and play them. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I don't, I don't. Did Space Quest? Well, there wasn't a Commodore sixty four version of that game, was there? Nope. I'm not nope, there was. Nope. Uh, uh, Sierra never dabbled in the Commodore 64. They dabbled in the Commodore Amiga. Apple II. Uh, Apple II, yes. Uh, uh, Sierra people were, were Apple people to begin with, uh, I believe. Um, like uh, the Apple II, they really loved that thing. Uh, of course, they got their start with IBM and the PC Junior, the ill-fated PC Junior. Peanut. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, uh, the first King's Quest game was one of those deals they made with IBM. IBM said, "Oh, we need some sort of flagship product to you know boost the sales of our PC Junior." Sierra, hey, go off and do something cool and awesome. And they came back with King's Quest, and yay! And so, uh, but yeah, they were mostly Mac people. Lucasfilm, on the other hand, Ron Gilbert and that whole crew built uh, Maniac Mansion and Zach McCracken and such for the for the Commodore sixty four. Yeah, the wow. before and the the Amiga is actually where I played most of these games for the first time. Yeah, uh, my the police quest on the Amiga. Uh, my <laughs> sympathies for anyone who had to play uh, Sierra <laughs> games on the Amiga. That's some damn. of your videos. You're like, these are horrible. They are. <laughs> what, what is it about the Amiga versions? Oh, it it just the the engine that they, the the AGI games are you know pretty okay i mean they've got more colors than their uh pc counterparts amiga had 32 colors pc had 16 colors so so space quest looks uh, uh a lot better i suppose but uh once you get into sci with space quest 4 and king's quest 5 god they are so slow and they're hideous and oh god they're terrible they're really just terrible and it's just not my it's, it's not just my personal opinion like every review we could find from like Amiga Power and all those magazines and stuff. They're like, why? Why did you guys even bother? It even got to the point where by the time they got to King's Quest VI, they were like, screw the Amiga. We're not doing this. Uh, and then Revolution Software stepped in. The guys who did uh, Lure of the Temptress, Belize the Steel Sky, and Broken Sword, they stepped in and went, uh, uh, we can do it. Uh, so they actually just stripped the whole game apart, threw out Sierra's engine, and rebuild it in their own engine and that's why king's quest 6 on the amiga is actually quite good <laughs> as opposed to king's quest 5 yeah i mean i remember thinking about the, the lucasfilm games like secret of monkey island was just fantastic on the amiga you know in my yeah. opinion it's a lovely game got a lot of high reviews but yeah the sierra ones <laughs> like i remember playing police quest and thinking wow these graphics are terrible <laughs> <laughs> you know, they didn't make any effort to like update it or take advantage of the amiga's uh not really, not really. Uh, Space Quest One, they recolored some of the graphics to take advantage of the thirty-two colors, but they somehow ruined one of the glorious jokes in Space Quest One, which is when you buy your ship, which is 
actually a stolen ship, but whatever. And you, and you take off, and, and the text box goes, off into the purple yonder we go, because the sky's purple in the, in the EGA version on, on the PC. But on the Amiga version, they actually called, because it's a desert planet, so they actually colored the sky like orange. So now it says, off into the purple yonder we go, and the sky is orange. And you're like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess they just probably thought the Amiga was kind of an afterthought. Uh, very right much, now. very much so. They did not give, they frankly did not give two shits about the Amiga. Uh, we, we, we got into that little rabbit hole in, in one of my videos where we, we, uh, we figured out that uh, Space Quest 4 and King's Quest 5 don't do palette swapping for any of the screens. It's the same color palette for every single screen, which is why they look so damn hideous. Uh, you'd think just the bare basic of effort would be to at least choose a suitable color palette for each of the screens, but nah, they just shut that thing out the door. Hmm. Yeah, the PC Junior. <laughs> I guess they put their cards in that chips in that basket, which I guess it worked out okay with the, the Tandy later on. But yeah, I think I had Gun and Roberta on my show not too long ago. Yeah. Oh, she is. She's fantastic. I I get a I get a rap for like being anti King's Quest or or somehow hating Roberta Williams's guts. Nothing could be further from the truth. I love the woman. She is. I mean, if it wasn't for Roberta Williams, we wouldn't be talking about adventure games, modern graphic adventure games today. She did it first. So we owe everything everything about the adventure games, the modern adventure game genre, we owe to Roberta Williams. Yeah, she was great. I'm just checking to see. Have you done a mystery house? <laughs> no, I have not. Uh, I've done an interview with Ken and Roberta, and I actually have a copy of the original PC Junior version of King's Quest with their signature on it. Ooh, humble brag. Oh, <laughs> or no. not so humble brag. <laughs> yeah, they did. No, I was kind of, kind of curious. I played a couple of those early ones. I think they did like a time machine. Yeah. Time Machine, I'm pretty sure it was the title of that. It's like three or four discs. <laughs> it's pretty ambitious for back in the day. Yeah. The old the, Wizard uh, Princess series. But yeah, yeah, I don't think uh, other than historical value, you know, is anybody really playing those? I mean, pretty much King's Quest is their first one that people kind of light up and <laughs> oh yeah, King's Quest. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the one that you know made Sierra really take off. Although I uh, I guess we could we could trace the graphic adventure game. Well, the modern graphic adventure game back to Mystery House, the right. first uh, where where Roberta was like up, up. She played what was called adventure, later became Colossal Cave, and she was like, "I want to do my own game." And Ken Williams was like the database programmer. He's like, "Okay, sure, I can program a text adventure. Why not?" I said, "Yeah, but I want to add like graphics. I want to add drawings and stuff." And he's like, "Really?" Uh, or the story at least goes actually goes that, that Ken suggested, "Why don't we add?" graphics and then he sort of caught himself mid-sentence and went no, no no wait let's not do that but roberta just lit up and went yeah let's do that yeah, that's a cool story i really think those this it's a great pair oh yeah you know, i think they work well oh they're 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 amazing i mean i we <laughs> we all owe them so much i mean it's yeah yeah see so you they, got a view about their colossal case 3d yeah, that was it. That was really interesting, actually. They uh, they sort of let me uh, have a couple of uh, exclusives, I guess. I was I was I was the first one to break the news about what their upcoming game was. At the time, there was just like, oh, Ken, Ken's coming out of retirement. He wants to program a new game, and it's, just, it's kind of a secret what kind of game it is. And and uh, uh, someone on their team let me in and said, hey, you know what? You, we've picked you to break the news so to speak um wow. so i got to do that <laughs> i don't know why because <laughs> again at the time at, um the 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 dude who contacted me actually said you know what the, the joke is since you've given all the king's quest games so much grief on your channel it would be hilarious if you were the one to break the news it's like yeah i can see that <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think you've kind of cracked the the nut on this. You know, because something I've thought about for a long time. When I, you know, I've tried to review adventure games, but it's hard, right? Because you don't want to spoil the puzzles, and you know, that's always the trade off. 
you know, but I think your approach works so well because I mean, listening to you is, is just as entertaining as the game. <laughs> you've got like, oh my god, <laughs> it's got like a riff tracks kind of a, a MST three K <laughs> thing going. It, uh, I, it, they are great. I, I, I repeatedly lo- even on those like the little Space Quest primers. <laughs> 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 I did not expect to be laughing this hard, you know. But wow. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, my 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 approach is is I don't really care if I spoil a game. <laughs> it's just I'm I'm under the assumption because that's how I work. When I look up a game on YouTube, I've pretty much I either I've played the game and I just want to hear someone else's opinion, or it's a game I can't be bothered to play myself and I just want to know what happens. So spoilers don't really affect me. It's that yeah. So I'm 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 going by the same. If if someone watches my videos, I'm gonna spoil the shit out of this game. <laughs> yeah, I just gotta show this. Yeah, so you got this series. You go through each of these. Uh... You have to tell me if you've done this for other ones, uh, but for the Space Quest, you'd go through the whole series. Hmm. And these are only about. I think the longest one is like ten minutes, but yeah, that was the uh, that pretty much hit every point. <laughs> <laughs> that was the <laughs> thank you. That was that was the conceit. The conceit was if if someone had to take a test on Space Quest in the morning and they couldn't play through the entire game, I was just gonna do the Cliff's notes of um you know all the Space Quest games. Um, I'm not entirely sure why I did it, just because you know because I did I did a Let's Play series of them, you know, full Let's Plays, long ass Let's Plays, and who has time to no. sit through that shit? Um, so I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to condense these down to 10 minutes or less. Boom. Off we go. Yeah. You got all sorts of great, I like the way you kind of intersperse all the little trivia and the history (laughs) and the context in here. Like you get a good sense of the guys from Andromeda. You know, you talk about the developers a lot. You know, I think you know a lot of things I, you just, you wouldn't see in a typical, you know, space quest video. And then there's really several, the, the quality is really high. Thank you. Uh, I disagree, but thank you. Oh, come on, what do you disagree with? <laughs> I have I have no enviable or marketable skills whatsoever. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's it's a shits and giggles kind of deal for me, and I'm I'm still surprised anyone's actually watching it or, or being nice about it. But it's yeah, that's just this is just stuff I think about. So I decided, you know, let's put it out there. That's probably what you know you. have you probably would do a lot worse if you were, you know, if you did have a big ego and you were, you know, trying to be impressive. You know, I always find the the videos I put the most work into. Nobody cares. I mean, it's like the lowest videos. Something I just slap together. You know, for some reason, I don't know if it's like the some people talk about like authenticity of a video. Like it's just you. You're not trying to embellish or pretend to put on a show or anything like that. No, people have uh, commented on videos I've done. Like, uh, are you? Why do you swear so much? Uh, are you always this grumpy uh, and stuff like? I mean, just like uh, uh, a lot. Some some people say oh, you, sh- you should stop swearing. Uh, I've never you, you, played you a space get... quest game. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I've never. I never cut. I, I seldom curse myself, but yeah, playing these games, it's like hitting your thumb with a hammer sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, but but yeah, it's this this that is generally how I talk normally. Uh, when I uh, you know do let's plays, most of it is just a blur after I'm done because it's just stream of consciousness. Whatever comes out comes out. Uh, so when I get a comment like someone put in a timestamp and go, I I lulled at this moment and I'm like I have no idea. Thank you so much for putting in a timestamp. I have no idea what I said. <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess I can relate to that. Well, why? Uh, I guess the questions that were sent in for you, I got yeah. a lot of questions from fans of yours, I guess. Probably more Space Quest, if I'm Space honest. Space Quest fans. And... You're too modest. <laughs> not really. No. I, okay. but sure. Why not? Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I think we've kind of uh, we figured this out already. I think that Space Quest was well. Uh, this, the question is: Was Space Quest your first era series? Uh, according, I feel like well, we- according to recollection, yes. Uh, the story goes that 
my parents when i was eight years old my parents went to some of their friends and it was like like you know the adults are going to sit down and have dinner and, and do their thing and the the kid needs to be occupied somehow so they plunked me down in front of you know the computer they were visiting someone so they plunked me down in front of that computer and booted up whatever was first and it was space quest 2 and i just sat there the entire evening just wandering around the first screen and, and, and had a had a blast um so that sort of planted the seed i guess so I'm pretty sure that was the uh, first uh, Sierra game because before, I mean, at home, we just had a Commodore 64 and they had an IBM PC and I was like, whoa, whoa, this is, this is next level shit. You thought, yeah, I've decided to become the space quest historian. Uh, well, uh, yeah, well, that came a little later. <laughs> At eight years old, I, I didn't even, I mean, the text parser was a complete mystery to me. I didn't you probably guess there would be this thing called YouTube and that you'd be uploading videos about this this game. I mean, it, well, yeah, my, my clairvoyance skills were yeah, just burgeoning right. at the point, yeah. but yeah. A little swelling at the temples. <laughs> no, I had no idea. We, we, I mean, the internet hadn't been invented, so to speak, yet. So, I mean, we had no idea what was, what was coming down the line. Um, Back then, we had these things they called magazines. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember a friend of mine from school, uh, must have been like a year later or something, maybe a couple of years later, uh, somehow he got hold of a walkthrough for Space Quest Two, and he printed it out on his dad's dot matrix printer. So we had this long like scroll of commands that uh, we were supposed to type in because we didn't speak English very well. Uh, so, you know, we, we typed in exactly what it told us to do and you know, somehow finished the game with that. Yeah. You know, I don't, I feel like that's the only way you can get through those games. Uh, I hear people sometimes like, oh, I didn't use any guides. I didn't need any walkthroughs. I just, I'm always like, oh, really? Uh, um, I'm so I, skeptical. I'll be perfectly honest. I, I, when I was a kid, I didn't finish any Space Quest games or any games really without consulting a walkthrough at least. Yeah, mostly every step of the way because because my patience just runs out uh, at some point i get so invested in what's going on that i just want to see what's what comes next and i'm like hey, yeah this this cock block in front of me is just uh too, oh, how do i get rid of it come on uh yeah. and it's it's only after the fact you start appreciating the thought that went into the puzzle design and the mechanics behind it and all that sort of stuff but when you're in the moment i remember gabriel knight uh, the first time I played that, I was like, "Yeah, but how do I progress? Come on, can we can we dispense with the fucking voodoo code and all that shit? Can we just get to the point, please?" Oh, like all the stupid mazes and things. Yeah, I think that <laughs> even in the first one, you were talking about how you're sort of in the ship and you're supposed to know that somehow that there's a first aid kit, I believe, or there's something like in the. It's not actually shown in the graphics. So I mean, for example, how would somebody know to do that? You know, if they didn't have a hint site or a hint. Oh, how yeah, would, the, would make somebody just, just you know know to type that in. I'm sorry. No, the first Space Quest game, um, legendarily, my good friend uh, Jess, who um, gave me my start, so to speak, he had the first ever Space Quest fan site on the internet, and we became friends. Uh, we started sending each other like floppy disks in the mail, like transatlantic <laughs> floppy disks of, of I'd, I'd write stuff then, for his website, and he put it on like months after the disc arrived and stuff um but he was famously stuck on the uh, glass shard puzzle in space quest one uh the invisible glass shard in front of uh, roger's pod he was stuck on that for a year a full year well, how do you uh, get unstuck i mean well at least in the later <laughs> games you can try you know you get well, once you get the full graphic interfaces and then do away do away with the text parser you can try everything on everything you know, go through that. But with those games, uh, you know, it's just there's infinite things. <laughs> yeah, and that's the that's the uh, the trade off, so to speak. Uh, the the player's freedom versus the structure of and, and and intent of the designer. And there's some sort of middle ground there that I don't think Sierra quite got with the icon interface because that's too constricting, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Games that have contextual interfaces are usually my jam. For some ass backwards reason, Leisha Suit Larry 7 has probably the best UI of any adventure game ever, in my opinion. Oh, no. Because 
every time you click on a hotspot, you get this little like right click windows pop up menu. Uh, look, take, poke, whatever. It's all contextual to the object you clicked on. So you can you can never misclick like talk to door. You can never do that. And in addition to that, it offers uh, um, an optional text parser. So you can input your own verb as to what you want to do with this object. That is by far my favorite UI. Which, which laser suit Larry is up again? That's seven. Make a note of that. <laughs> I've often been a. Uh, want to get too far? Well, I guess it doesn't really matter. We can do whatever we, we like. <laughs> I've always been curious. <laughs> you know, you hear all this stuff about the, uh, the AI and the, the Chat GPT and, and all that business, and I always wondered, you know, what if they'd have had that back when they were making these games with the text parsers? <laughs> it, it probably could have done a better job trying to interpret and give you subtle hints and things and. You know, I wonder if we might come back to some of these games uh, and try to put an AI in there. Uh, well, you'd still have to rein it in. So, to, I mean, AI is is. I mean, you can have fun with it. For for my money, AI is is again shits and giggles mainly. Uh, if you use it for any sort of end goal, creative use, you sort of paint it yourself in in a in a corner. Um, but I will. Uh, uh, Allo actually did something really clever with the uh, with the first Lisa Suit Larry game all the way back in was it eighty seven or eighty eight or something like that. Um, what he did was he sent the game out to beta testers, and he had a little piece of code in there that would write everyone's input into a separate text file. Mm -hmm. So when he got the game back from testers, he'd have this long list of things that they tried to put into the parser and gotten no no meaningful response so he could go back into the code and write responses for you know what people had tried to do there's this famous story about how uh sierra sent him off to like demo the game at some you know investor or whatever so you got this boardroom full of people in fancy suits and there's al Lowe trying to demo this slightly raunchy uh, comedy game and and he he sort of nervously asked the room like okay what what should i type in and and some suit like it, again like like patrick bateman hair comb bag armani suit and all that just shouts masturbate <laughs> <laughs> and he puts it in and and like sweat dripping off his brow and the game goes the whole point was to stop doing that larry <laughs> Got a big laugh, and apparently he walked home with a bag of money. I don't know. That's hilarious. Yeah, I think that was one of the things I really envied my neighbor because he had the uh, the DOS machine. I had the uh, Commodore <laughs> 64, mm. so I couldn't play Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> it's like I'd always go over to his house to play. But yeah, mm. that's great, great times. That so doesn't surprise this... me about Al. I mean, that that's pretty clever. I mean, uh, he's, he's he's basically doing what this uh, AI is doing, right? Just the, the the dude is very clever. So what people I don't think people give Al credit enough for the thought he puts into how adventure games work and their mechanics and stuff like that. The reason why he came up with the Lisa Suit Larry Seven UI was because he felt that the Sierra icon bar was too restrictive as well, and he's he's always thinking uh, like about how mechanics of adventure games work more than say plot of which there's barely any in the Lisa Suit Larry games uh you know plot and set pieces and all that he's more interested in like mechanics and stuff like that um what was this against oh yeah someone someone is actually rebuilding the first Lisa Suit Larry game for the Commodore 64. <laughs> the dude, dude's on Twitter posting a, a progress report of so that and it will run on an actual Commodore 64. He's got Larry moving around the screen, and you can use the text parser and such. But he's constantly like hitting that wall of "Oh shit, I'm out of RAM." Oh shit, I'm out of RAM. Yeah, there's a lot of projects like that going on. It's kind of amazing, really. Mm. I mean, people I'm know more now than they did back then. I'm fascinated by demakes. Uh, I mean, everyone's always on about like like remakes. Oh, when are they going to do Space Quest Three in 256 colors? When are they going to do? Uh, like like whatever like like AI upscales of uh, whatever and and stuff and I'm like I'm actually kind of interested to see demakes I'm I, I'd love to see like 
Commodore 64 version of Space Quest 6. Like you control them around with a joystick. And, Why is uh, that? We could make it the VIC-20 or the, <laughs> the Commodore yeah. version. <laughs> <laughs> that it, would be impressive. Yeah, because it's sort of a litmus test to how well does the gameplay hold up if you strip yeah. away all the bells and whistles and you're left with just blocks of pix- pixels like <laughs> just <laughs> banging into each other. Like, what are you actually left with? Are you still left with a good game? And I think for, for my money, if you, if you like D made any of the Space Quest games, I'm probably biased, but yeah, I, th- I think you'd, you'd, you'd still have a good time. Yeah, I think about that. Some I was playing some of the uh, some of the remakes. I think it was Monkey Island <clears throat> fairly mm. recently. And I was thinking that I kind of like the charm. There's something kind of charming about the original look. <laughs> you yeah. Know, yeah, I agree. The new look is fine, but you lose a little something, you know. And I'd be interesting to see what would happen if you took the later ones and, like you say, D made them. <laughs> yeah. You know, what that experience would be like. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. I mean, there is a. One thing I'll say about the special editions of the Monkey Island game, the first two Monkey Island games, is the voice acting is spectacular. Oh, absolutely. So there is actually, you know, Intrepid fans have uh, have conjured up a way to get uh, Scum VM to play the original disc-based versions of Monkey Island with the voiceover. It's like a whole patch you have to run. This. So you can play the original games, but with the voiceovers. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I had Dominic on the show not too long ago. Uh, I, didn't realize, I didn't realize how much of, I mean, you kind of think you know this stuff, but just the, the roles, all that these voice actors bring <laughs> to the experience is just amazing. Oh, uh, he is. He is. I mean, he sounds exactly like what Guybrush did in my head and probably everyone else. Even Ron Gilbert went on record saying, yeah, you know what? He is Guybrush. There's just no other. So, yeah, absolutely. Dude's a legend. And the poor fucker had to read all of the book titles in Monkey Island 2 when you go into the library. He had to read all of those. Like, Monkey Island 2's script is astronomically huge. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Yeah, Gary Owens. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, for Space Quest. I mean, could you think of uh, I mean, what, what value? <laughs> I mean, uh, Can you imagine God. it without, without him? I mean, no. No, absolutely not. And the the thing is, what Gary Owens is famous for in the U.S., we we didn't have that in in Denmark. Uh, Laughing and Space Ghost and uh, Powdered Toast Man and all the stuff that he's famous for. I had no idea what that was. To me, he was just a voice, but he was just the perfect voice, just absolutely pitch perfect. And it was such a shame that he didn't get to to do you know the the dialogue in Space Quest Five, even though it wasn't written by Scott Murphy and all that sort of stuff. It's just like he's just amazing. And actually, someone on my Discord has sacrilegiously uh, fed lines from Gary Owens into one of those voice synthesizer AIs again, just for shits and giggles, not for anything. Like he's not going to put out anything with it. It's just fun to hear what. You know what the AI would interpret. Gary Owens reading aloud lines from the earlier games, like Space Quest One, Two, and Three, that didn't have voiceovers and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's kind of in the sacrilegious sort of uh, dudes probably spinning in his grave kind of thing. But also, yeah, there's going to be a lot of stuff like that. I, just, I don't know how to feel about it sometimes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of on, I'm, uh, I'm kind of on the fence on that because f- f- everyone who is in the creative business says AI is absolute garbage and we should all nuke it and burn it with fire. And I can see why, but it, it can also be used as a creative springboard. And that's, uh, that's an, that's an avenue. I think most people fail to see that you can use it for inspiration. You don't have to take what it generates wholesale and try to put that into the world because that's, that's what they're referring to as the garbage if you use it as inspiration, if you ask a text prompt, hey, uh, could you like come up with 10 good names for planets in a solar system or something? And it just spits out a list and you go, okay, that's a good name. That's a good name. If I tweak that, that's also a good name. Like you use it for inspiration, but not as a not as a creative so much, clutch. You know, if I was trying to work with an artist and like, well, can you give me a, some idea of what you picture? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really tough. I've been trying to describe it in words. 
if I could go to bring some kind of AI generated thing and say basically something like this, you know, could you draw this but make it nice? Mm, yeah, could you could you, <laughs> you use know, this? I don't, as... I don't see what is that really the problem? I mean, uh, no, <laughs> to me, no. Uh, to some, it is is absolutely unthinkable to even suggest that AI could be used for anything. Um, but I'm I'm not quite in that camp. I understand why people are so iffy about uh, generative AI because of you know how it steals all its output from copyrighted sources and all that sort of stuff. And that's absolutely I yeah. Think has there been an AI in this? In a fictional context, somewhere in the Space Quest, uh, <laughs> surely there must have been a <laughs> an guess, AI uh, uh, subplot or something. Yeah, I guess uh, Space Quest Four has Vohal's uh, consciousness uploaded into a computer. Right. Yeah. Okay. So he's he's technically dead, but his conscious somehow got left on a on a desk. <laughs> the story is that uh, a copy of Leisure Suit Larry Four. Famously, the Lisa Suit Larry that never got made um, was floating around in space, and you know, scientists from Roger's home planet found it, and they got all excited, and they uploaded the fucking thing into their big supercomputer that controls all facets of their planet, and uh, up comes the virus, uh, the Vohol virus, so to speak. So I guess he's kind of an AI, in a sense. That's very prescient, I think. Yeah. It'd be funny to see what they would come up with, you know, today with that. Oh, they would have a field day, wouldn't they? <laughs> Let's see. And I get, I don't. Have you ever seen the uh, low budget Canadian? Horror, this is way off topic, but I mean, there's a Canadian low budget horror film called Screamers, which is based off a uh, Philip K. Dick story. Um, I've read a lot of read a lot of Dick. I don't know if I've heard that seen that film though. What's called Screamers? Yeah, it's uh, it it stars Peter Weller. Uh, out of the Robocop suit, and um, <laughs> yeah. and it's Weller. This is sounding good. So what is? Oh, he's, it's really good. And and uh, the uh, the the thing about that is, um, you got some robots running around on a planet. <clears throat> yep, that's the one. You yeah, got some robots. Like, I feel like I read that. Yep. Uh, the, the punchline again. Spoilers. Who cares? Um, the point is, they, you got these robots running around, uh, killing each other. And you got humans in the mix, and you can't really tell who's a robot and who's not a robot. Uh, but by the end, one of the robots sacrifices itself in order to save one of the humans by killing another robot. And the one of the last lines, the point in lines, is that you're 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 starting to become alive because you're starting to have morals and ethics and learning how to understand that sort of shit. So once an AI starts learning how to have morals and ethics and a moral compass that's not just generated off whatever input's been fed into its training set once it starts becoming slightly self-aware yeah. about what uh, the implications of its actions could be then we're actually talking about something that could be considered a genuine life form and then we're into a whole heap of worms shit right there yeah there's been sci-fi yay episodes about that yeah somebody was uh we were talking about the uh, Roger Wilco. Oh was, yeah, oh yeah, that was the topic, wasn't it? Like the fact that not not you and I. Well, we've kind of been talked about it a little bit, but uh, somebody had talked about why he was a janitor, and I was I thought it was probably something to do with Planet Fall. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Yes, yes, I am. It, I don't know if there's been... any connection there or or what. Uh, it has been suggested that they that they ripped off uh, Infocom's Planet Fall and Station Fall. Um, and it is one of uh, Scott Murphy's favorite games uh, of the uh, text adventure era, um, but he he claims innocence. He claims it was not uh, directly inspired by Planet Fall. What they wanted was a sort of a, a quote unquote a sort of unimportant person, right? As an as a, like an everyday Joe whose contribute uh, contributions to you know society and whatever he's environment he's in is not terribly important he's uh he, uh, scott murphy describes roger wilco as a path of least resistance kind of guy he's not dumb he's not a klutz he's actually fairly smart and he has ingenuity and he can think for himself but he's just you know what i don't i just want to take a nap i just want to go back to bed could we stop with it he's just thrust into situations he doesn't want to be in 
and that was a uh, that that was the point. So so making him a janitor was more of a sort of uh, who's who's the most unimportant person on a research spaceship? It's probably the dude who scrubs the floors. Let's be honest. Yeah, I was thinking too of uh, the, yeah. I don't know if you ever watched Red Dwarf. I love fucking red dwarf it's yeah, my it was my favorite tv show when i was a kid they're like vending machine repair or something like that yeah <laughs> yes yep there's 169 people on board red dwarf and lister ranked 169 bottom of the pile and the only reason why rimmer is a superior is because he ranked 168 not too bad he didn't pass that chef was he trying to be a chef one time <laughs> yeah because that actually outranks rimmer <laughs> Yeah, second technician chicken soup repair man you know of course these uh they're sort of parroting a lot of these i guess shows they would have been watching like uh probably buck rogers flash gordon you know stuff like that you think well that's int- uh, now we're kind of getting into uh the uh, space quest one remake the vga remake from 1991 and uh, there's a lot of a lot of people really like that one uh, and, and and I can see why, because, you know, it's flashy and um, it, it, it took what worked in the original and uh, gave it a nice new coat of paint and such. But um, it's actually... Which sorry? remake is it again? Uh, Space Quest 1 got, okay. a, got a VGA remake in 1991. Okay, let's see if I can bring it up here. But actually, the two guys from Andromeda really, really hates that thing. Uh, because, for one, it was sort of bait behind their backs while they were busy making Space Quest 4. Oh. Um and and two, it went for this sort of retro sci-fi, Buck Rogers uh type 1950s sci-fi kind of feel. And that kind of went against the uh, f- philosophy is probably too grandiose a word, but kind of went against what they had envisioned for for Space Quest as a whole, which was futuristic. It was supposed to be cutting edge futuristic, and ha- having that sort of throwback style kind of went against what they had you know in, in mind for the series i think if i managed to find the right one yep that's the one let's see screenshots also has an amiga version not well, as t- in a bad uh art direction for this yeah that one definitely <laughs> i think I that's that must be the amiga there. yeah that's the amiga <laughs> i wonder if there's like a side-by-side comparison oh god and actually uh, uh vga the remake of, of, of Space Quest One actually does do palette swapping, so this is one of the prettier SCI games on the Amiga. There's the DOS one. There we go. Let's see. Yeah, I mean everything just really screams uh, like 1950s sci-fi uh, throwback, which is fine. I mean it's it's not it's not a terrible looking game at all. I I, I think it, it's 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 really good. And some of the extra text that was included is is really funny, although it wasn't written by Scott Murphy or anyone on the team uh, or the original creators and such. Like. But it's um, it's just it just feels off to me, and mm-hmm. it certainly feel it's a sore point if you bring it up in front of Scott Murphy. He'll tell you to get the fuck out of his house. <laughs> oh wow. Trust me, I've tried. <laughs> Make note of that. Yeah, that, that was one of the interesting things is all the sort of who's writing what and they're bringing up was it, uh, one of the space quests where Josh Mandel comes in and like he was yeah. going to write the one and then they brought the other guy back. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, got a was... twisted, twisted tale. <clears throat> yeah, because Space Quest 4 was meant to be the last game in the series. That was really that was supposed to be the end of it. He goes into the time warp. He finally gets to go home to his home planet, and that was it. And then, uh, you know, the two guys went their separate ways. Uh, Mark Crow moved to to Oregon to you know have a family and and all that. Scott stayed in Oakhurst, and uh, and Space Quest was sort of yeah, we're done. It's over. And then at some point, uh, Ken Williams wanted because he saw that Dynamics were doing adventure games because. Uh, when Marco relocated to Oregon, he went to work with uh, Dynamics, which was which was owned by Sierra at the time, um, and they had done some adventure games like uh, Willy Beamish and uh, uh, Heart of uh, Heart of China. Yeah, that's the one, um, and 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 stuff like that. But they 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 used their own in house game engine, and Ken Williams was like, "If you guys are going to do adventure games, you should probably do it in the engine that Sierra uses." So, you know, there's a unified thing to it. So he kind of threw Space Quest V at them as a sort of 
like test like to see can you actually do, can you actually work our game engine and out came space quest five so it wasn't really supposed to be a sequel but it just sort of happened and then space quest six and at that point they were just like oh well five actually turned out pretty decent uh why don't we keep this train going and yeah josh mandel had been promised if if we're going to do another space quest game uh because you know sierra weren't about to take that lying down like the two guys saying okay four is done that's it that's the final chapter it's like nah you're not the boss of us we want another space quest game so we're going to give it to, to this guy who's over in the wings going i want to do a space quest game and that was josh mandel and he was he was like told okay you can do space quest five We've passed the baton on to you. You can do it. Uh, he'd done a lot of ghost writing on uh, uh, Space Quest 4. Uh, some brilliant, brilliant writing. Like all the uh, parody boxes in the software store. Uh, yeah, they're hilarious. That was him. Um, so they said, okay, you can do Space Quest 5. And then like last minute, they were like, actually, we're going to give it to Dynamics. And he's like, oh, okay. That must have sucked. It did. And then Space Quest 6 rolls around and he's like, okay can I do Space Quest now? And they say, yeah, yeah, all right, you can do six. And he gets about halfway through the project and then he just gets so fed up with, you know, the shit house Sierra had become in the mid nineties. And he was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. See ya. So he just leaves the project halfway through. Yeah, it's so depressing that, you know, I re recently read Ken Williams' book on that and he talked about how they just kind of got caught up in this, these big industry shifts that were going on, the all the 3D stuff, and then the CD-ROM, and then the yeah. you know, first-person shooters. And <laughs> they yeah. were trying to do full-motion video stuff. You know, of course, that didn't pan out very well in the, for whatever reason. Uh, full-motion video was a strange beast. Oh, there was one question about full-motion video, wasn't there? And yeah. Quest have had an, should Space Quest have had an FMV entry? <laughs> <laughs> Not if Sierra had done it, no. No, Sierra's uh, approach to FMV was terrible. It sacrificed gameplay for spectacle. Um, you only have to look at games like Phantasmagoria 2 or even the bloated monstrosity that was the first Phantasmagoria game. Uh, I think the only FMV game they ever did that came close to being like remotely playable was Gabriel Knight 2. And even that had some fucking jank in it. Like they like they just filled up all the CDs with mindless cutscenes of Dean Erickson opening a drawer, closing a drawer, taking shit out of a bag, putting it back in, and all this. It's that get you know, they even had to cut the script down to, to fit it onto six CDs. There's this massive time jump between disc five and six. Uh, because they they practically they skipped three whole chapters and just put it in a cutscene. Uh, and, and and then it just like speeds off it like a bullet train because uh, they couldn't fit all that unpacking, opening drawers shit onto however many CDs they were going for. And they were out of budget and out of time and all that shit. So no, Sierra, as, oh, as much as we love uh, to look back at the glory days of Sierra, they did not approach FMV with any sort of grace or style, if you ask me. I've got the impression that they there was just so much glamour, you know, for the movies. I'm like, oh, we can finally stop being lowly game developers. And, you know, mm -hmm. people when I interviewed them, they were still going on about how amazing it was to have this director's or producer's chair for Roberta to sit in and you know, like, <laughs> all this stuff. And I'm, yeah, as a hobby, it, it's fun. And, and, and it's not like FMVs are categorically bad. No, no. Yeah. Only have to look at the Tex Murphy games to see that you can do some fantastic stuff with FMV. If you look at a game like Pandora Directive, which is it's just a masterpiece from start to finish. It's got not only does it have full motion video, not only does it actually have puzzles and gameplay, it also has branching paths and uh, your dialogue choices affect the outcome of the story. It has seven different endings and, and all this sort of shit. It has replay value up the ass. It is an amazing game. Um, Sierra has opening drawers. <laughs> yeah, I just talked to uh, Curtis, you know, from the... Yeah! Paul Morgan Stetler, and yeah, he was telling me that... Uh, I forget how many hours, but some absurd number of hours they just recorded him just basically standing around and like idle, yeah. <laughs> idly. <laughs> I mean, 
Yeah. I'm doing that for a full day of that. <laughs> I love and, and Phantasmagoria too. Don't get me wrong. I, I I have some sort of weird affinity for uh, even Phantasmagoria one, but in a sort of uh, in a in a sort of like uh, when you listen to a piece of music or you see a painting or something and you just go, "What is this garbage?" and you start reading about the artist and you want to know what possessed them to do this and you start getting interested in the mechanics of it more so than the game Phantasmagoria 2 is basically a long click the mouse to get to the next scene game until you get to the final CD and they go, oh, wait, we're supposed to be an adventure game. And then they chuck this fucking logic puzzle at you while you're trying to run away and explode and the music is pumping and all that shit. And they put this logic puzzle in front of you with no rules, no explanation. You're supposed to fix this fucking teleporter to get out of whatever dimension hell you're in. And it's just like, uh, excuse me? Yeah, it really says a lot, I think, that Gabriel Knight 3, you know, of course, they went back to the <laughs> what was working. <laughs> to well, or did they? Um, yeah, it, well, you know, they still have that cat mustache business. That's <laughs> something that I want to talk yeah. about. She's That's, washed her, she's I, washed her I, hands I love, of that one. I love all the Gabriel Knight games for even, you know, words of all. Mm. That's interesting. I've never actually finished Gabriel Knight three because that went into uh, you know the world of three D. What it it did do something I thought was very fascinating and very interesting. And something other games should also have tried to pick up and run with was that you don't control the main character, you control the camera around him. Hmm. That is really really interesting and a really good way of doing that whole exploration thing because you're not bogged down waiting for the fucking walk animation to finish and watching him get stuck on geometry and you know his pathfinding screws up and all that you're, you're you can you're free to zoom around that fucking place um that was that was really clever that's a really good point it uh, looked like shit but <laughs> uh, and 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 i can say that because um, I'm, I'm in the uh, fortunate position where I'm able to call uh, Robert Holmes, Jane's uh, husband, uh, a, a pretty good friend of mine at this point. And I told him uh, at one point that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I called Gabriel Knight 3. I thought I called, I, th I think I called it a butt fucking ugly game in, in a video. And he replied back and said, oh, don't be sorry. It is fucking ugly. <laughs> Everyone thought it was hideous when they were working on it. It was like the, the tech just wasn't there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's been long enough. The only, about the only thing I really remember is that cat mustache. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, <laughs> I, was, I was actually talking to, I was talking to Robert recently because uh, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. So if, if I'm not, cut that out. But uh, um, I'm, I'm doing the artwork for, for Robert's new album that's coming out, um, Son of Sequel doing these music albums in the vein of Gabriel Knight's soundtrack. Basically, like if Gabriel Knight had a fourth or fifth or sixth installment, he'd just write music that sounds like it. Um, and he asked me to do the artwork for him. And I said, you know what? We should hide some Easter eggs in the artwork. Let's like uh, let's have some stuff written in the Gabriel One uh, voodoo code uh, somewhere on the artwork to, you know, for people to pick up. And and he said, oh, yeah, let's uh, let's put in like, I gave Jane all her best ideas. And I was like, yeah, that's fantastic. Hey, what about cat hair mustaches are coming back in style? And he's like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. That's hilarious. Now, I did have a question about the, the music uh, that you're working on, because you're also a musician. Am I? <laughs> you stop it. <laughs> let's see. Uh, when arranging covers of PC game music for your albums, do you go back to play the game over again to remember to remember how the original pieces made you feel? I, I'm in the I guess fortunate or unfortunate position where I I don't really have to because one they're completely ingrained in my memory. Like when I hit like ninety, dribbling in a wheelchair, staring into a blank wall, and you know completely cut off from contact the only thing i'll be able to recite is the, you know the walkthrough for space quest one through six uh it's, so so I, I i know the games pretty well inside out and also i replay them quite a lot when i do videos and stuff because i always need to go back and capture footage of a certain uh, moment or whatever or someone has discovered something new in in one of the games um so that i need to capture some footage of so i replay them quite often it, it, bits and pieces of them anyway 
And as far as the music goes, uh, what I actually do, and this is why I sort of went, uh, really, uh, about the musician thing is the music on those Space Quest soundtracks that I put out, the reorchestrations one, once, what I do is I just, I just export the MIDI file from the games themselves and just chuck them into a piece of music software and just pick new instruments for what they're supposed to play. Dabble a little and like double some instruments around and add a little here and there, but it's basically just the MIDI file from the original games. So it's not, it's, no, it's, not, it's not a big creative endeavor, so to speak. You probably don't want to work for your music marketing team. <laughs> Maybe not, but again, well, it's great. I mean, you still, you got to find the right instruments. I mean, there's, there's some uh, audio uh, judgment that has to take place there. Oh, sure. Uh, it but, could uh, be but done badly. It could be done very badly. Could be done terribly. Um, uh, some would argue that it is being done terribly. But but <laughs> luckily, uh, most of those albums, the vinyl records and stuff like that, is just, you know stuff that we put out. And I say we, as in the community in, on my Discord and around the YouTube channel and all that, the, the SQH community is full of weirdos like me who just want to have the Space Quest soundtracks on vinyl. So they're just they don't really care how it sounds i guess they just okay this is a physical item and it's uh low number limited edition all that we crowdfunded it we made this thing happen kind of like what's on it who cares <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe i got a couple i got some records i pick up here and there but i don't actually have a record player <laughs> so, but... See, a lot of a lot of people say that that's like it, it, and the, it's you know it's just a cool medium it is, and it's the same with uh, big box games. Exactly. People collect big box. I, I do. I, I got a bunch of games on my, on my shelf that you cannot see because camera angles. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if any of the game discs work. I have the boxes for nostalgic value, and a lot of people collect vinyl records for the same reason. They want they, they just it looks good on a shelf. It's a physical item you can pick out and admire and look at and go yay. Um, I do have a turntable. In fact, I have too many. My my wife would certainly agree that I have too many of them. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, well, you, you know, I've been thinking about getting one. Again, we're kind of getting off topic, but who cares? Uh, so if I'm looking for a turntable, is it better to get like a new one, or is it better to look for like a vintage, uh, you know, an old one that still works? I guess the best piece of advice I can give you is look at the tone arm and the pickup. If it's that little plastic thing with the red cartridge on it, like you get in suitcase players and stuff, and they sometimes put those in turntables that look fairly decent, but once you see that little red cartridge and a little plastic tone arm, run away screaming. That's terrible news. Not that they're not that they won't ruin your record, so to speak, but it is the cheapest. Yeah, it's yeah, it's garbage. A uh, little sapphire stylus. It's not adjustable. It could. If you were really unlucky, fuck up your records. If you, yeah, not take care of it. If you want to get a vintage one, you go to a thrift store, you pick up a, a really decent thing with a, um, um, a direct drive turntable instead of a belt. So you know that there's electronics spinning the thing around instead of a little belt you have to change every 10 minutes or so. That's fine. Just change the stylus because usually if it's a used turntable, the stylus will have had a number of years on it and the the old styles might be all fucked up. So, yeah. Uh, other things that my dad taught me over the years, how to take care of your turntable and all that shit. That's cool. No, yeah, if I ever get around to it, I'll, I'll ping you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. Actually, okay. As long as we're off topic. At one point, uh, my dad texted me and said, uh, "I'm. do you want my record collection? And do you also want my turntable? And do you also want the uh, uh, nice uh, Bang & Olufsen speakers that I've had since you were a baby and all that sort of stuff? And I'm like, are you dying? Why? It's, it's like, no, nah, I'm just sick of it. It's just taking up too much space. And that's when I realized there's this big generational gap between my generation and my dad's generation where I see vinyl records as, oh, there's this fancy ritual. You put on a record, you put the needle in, you lean back, headphones on, close your eyes, or you read the liner notes. And it's sort of a magical the masturbatory session or whatever. But but to him, it's just it's just a chore. They take up too much space. You have to change the sides. You can't bring them to parties because people will spill their drinks on them and all that sort of shit. So for, to him, it's just like, eh, fuck it. 
streaming. That's the thing. And to me, it's like, ah, uh, go. That's interesting. Yeah, I could see that. You know, I've been feeling the same way. I like a lot of old music, but I've only ever listened to it on CDs or, you know, mm. or whatever. I've never actually listened to the, the, the vinyl of a lot of my favorite albums. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty cool. If you want a rabbit hole, I, I promise I'll stop talking about this in a minute. If you want a rabbit hole, check out a dude on YouTube called Parlogram. He is into Beatles. My dad was a big Beatles nerd because he was born in 1950. So that was right around the time when the Beatles were hot shit in the late 60s. Um, so he, uh, so one of the, I mean, his record collection, when he said, I'll give you my record collection, he's like, that's a lot of Beatles and that's a lot of Led Zeppelin. That's a lot. Of, he's got one Black Sabbath album and a lot of Deep Purple and all Queen and all this Deep sort of shit. It's like, yeah. Favorite. Hey, what? Yeah. It's only got one, but it's uh, it's the good one. I'm told. <laughs> but uh, in rock is the one you know, with the yeah. four faces on the yeah. Anyway, um, Parlogram is a dude who specializes in Beatles records and and especially auctioning Beatles records. So he gets all the different pressings and he makes these long winded fucking YouTube videos about how they're sonically different. Like if you want the best audio experience, you have to go for this German pressing and. The Australian one sounds like shit, and uh, oh, that's oh, it's and it's sort of oddly fascinating to me. It's the same music, and it was recorded on four track recorders in 1967. Like, how different can it sound? And apparently, a lot. I remember the first time somebody played the Roland MT32 versions of some of these <laughs> Sierra games, and I was just blown away. <laughs> oh God, that thing had no right to sound as good as it did. <laughs> I mean, you, you boot up a game like Space Quest 3 and you're like, yeah, okay, this looks really good. I mean, but by 1989, we did have MCGA cards and VGA cards. Uh, you had games like uh, Mean Streets uh, from Access, which was the, the first Tech Murphy game, uh, came out the same year and had VGA graphics, uh, which, you know, looked fantastic. And then you got Space Quest three which has 16 color ega graphics and you're like okay th i mean it's 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 still one of the best looking ega games of all time if you ask me it's, it still looks fantastic um and, and then you got like it was the first uh space quest game to uh support music cards atlib sound blaster stuff like that so you go okay so this is how stuff is supposed to sound in 1989 but if you had a Roland MT32, it was like having a fucking symphonic orchestra in your house. It's like, um, does it, how can it sound this good? It's just, and especially, you gotta, you gotta get a guy like Bob Siebenberg doing the soundtrack for your game. Uh, stuff's gonna happen. It's like professional synthesizer equipment, right? Yeah, really. It's like, oh, oh. Professionals were using this thing. Yeah, and, then, and King's Quest Four had uh, William Goldstein uh, who is also a, a professional TV and movie uh, uh, composer, although his claim to fame is ironically the TV show Fame from the uh, from the 80s. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think I described it in my King's Quest 4 video as glee, but with a lot of disco. Um, yeah, but this, that was his, but, but the soundtrack to King's Quest 4 is just amazing in every way. And on the MT32, it's chef's kisses. Yeah. I'm a music nerd. <laughs> <laughs> you got? Did you uh, take some classes in music or? No, no. See, okay. So here's oh, the thing, oh, right? Yeah, but... No, no. Here's the thing. I'm a drummer, and the joke is, what do you call a guy who hangs out with musicians? A drummer. <laughs> um, I'm in a band uh, with uh, with some dudes. Uh, <laughs> kind of an internet band. Our our guitar players in Chicago. Our bass players in Melbourne. Our keyboard player lives 30 minutes away from me. Um, and we're, uh, f oh, we're doing a record on the seventh guest and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's amazing stuff. But uh, our guitar player, John Paul in Chicago, is also a music teacher and he plays, uh, he plays the guitar fairly professionally. He has his own music store where he sells musical instruments. And of course, he has a room with drums. He has a big sign in the room with drums that says, Drummers must be accompanied by an adult at all times. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm a drummer. Drummers with me. I go like this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, Keith Moon. Oh! I still... Uh, the Mad Beast himself. Could you be... I mean, those songs would not be... No. Even a quarter is good. 
my God, that man was a beast often on the stage. Holy shit. I mean, the stories about him um, uh, taking some sort of OD uh, before hitting the stage. He got three songs in, collapsed on his drum stool. They took him backstage, showered him <laughs> with a cold shower for 30 minutes, then shoved him back on stage and to go play. <laughs> Dude. Ah. Yeah. yeah. My, fa- my favorite drummer is Jimmy Chamberlain from the Smashing Pumpkins because the man has no concept of dead air everything is just a, a, a wall of sound to this guy and he's a he was originally a jazz drummer so he didn't approach playing for the smashing pumpkin says okay we're gonna do rock music i'm gonna open my hi-hat and do all this sort of like uh dave grohl and nirvana so he was like i'm gonna freak out on the right symbol and do ghost notes and uh, just do lots and tons of fills and all that sort of stuff and the man's a beast way off topic here holy shit okay yeah. well you got that yeah it's just it's fun it's fun though right well, I'm, I'm, I'm a couple going. uh actually can, can we take a short break my um yeah, you want to take a little my, break? my system needs a little um let me pause and we'll come back sure, sure. no problem and do a little drumming myself with my trusty cowbell <laughs> I'm, I'm told you can always use a little more of this is that true I've, uh, I, I will I will trust everything Christopher Walken says, so yes. <laughs> Do you have a, you probably have an assortment of cowbells. Uh, no, I actually have an electric drum kit because uh, uh, there's not really a lot of room in my house. For... <laughs> no, but I could I could technically, you know, could, you can patch a cowbell sound into any of the pads and yeah, so I can I can do a cowbell if you want. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about getting one of those electric drum sets. Just it looks like fun to me. Oh, they are. And they've actually gotten really, really good. Um really I mean, good exercise too. Yeah. Yeah. You get you get some you got some leg work going, you got some arms going, you got a bit of sweat going. Yeah. It's a it's a workout. Probably um, your neighbors appreciate it too. <laughs> no, see, that's the thing about electric kits. That's another concern, obviously, is that acoustic kits make a lot of noise. Oh my god. <laughs> so Trying to play quietly, how can you? You know, you uh, the symbol. It's supposed to be loud. <laughs> that's the whole point. They're called crash symbols for a reason. Um, but yeah, electric kits, put on your headphones and put a put a nice blanket under the drums so they don't like rumble all the way down to your downstairs neighbors and, and you're you're pretty good to go. Well, I might I might try to I might look into that. I've always been kind of curious about it. I got a uh, a nitro mesh. Uh, and a, how expensive would you about how much would you need to spend to get a oh mine i got mine used uh-huh. um but but the uh, the elisis uh, nitro series is uh fairly affordable and actually very very it's one of those surprisingly good for the price kind of things um and the thing about the mesh kit is that it has this little it's a little, uh, screen door kind of thing over the uh, snare drum so you can actually wobble the drumstick up and down and make those little nice little ghost notes uh, so it's not like just a hard pad that you're hitting. Um, so yeah, good stuff. And it's great for any stressful day. Come home and just do some drum. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's it's yeah. I I will <laughs> concur with that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's say you got time for you got about uh, three or four, maybe as many as six uh, fan questions here. But I think they're pretty. They should be pretty short and sweet. You want to rapid Go fire? <laughs> Go for it. As Whatever time you have is whatever time I have. A uh, question from Rudy. Be- Beatrice Wankmeister. Lovely name. <laughs> Gotta get through these. Uh, Roger's future wife and their child were introduced in Space Quest 4, which Scott and Mark developed together. Space Quest 5 was developed by Dynamics with Mark, but without Scott and continued Beatrice's role. SQ-6 was developed at Sierra again with a new lady. Why? Well, Space Quest 4 was supposed to be the final game in the series. And um, the whole business about showing Roger his future wife in that little hologram and leaving that little breadcrumb with she was quite beautiful and you go, oh, why the past tense? Uh, That was all just a sort of little nudge to say, okay, have fun with that, you know, and then ride off into the sunset with that. Um, It's kind of like with um uh, with back to the future 
uh, there was this uh, this comment that the that, that they made that if they'd known they were going to do sequels to Back to the Future, they never would have put McFly's girlfriend Jennifer in the car at the end of the first movie because that painted them into such a weird corner that they had such trouble getting out of. And it's the same with uh, with uh, Space Quest. I mean, if they'd known that they would eventually have a fifth game and the sixth game in the series, I don't think they would have put Beatrice in it. In, in four at all it was just supposed to be this little nugget like haha and then fuck off before anyone caught wind of it um so yeah you'd have to ask mark why he kept going with beatrice in five uh i think because you know that carrot was just left dangling and uh i mean if you have a fifth game someone's bound to ask questions so he had her in as a as a character in it and for six i know uh josh mandel said that he thought it was a little too, I mean, it, it was, it was, you know, the back to the future kind of guy was like, why did you guys put that in there? Uh, it's, it's so cookie cutter. It's so like now everything's just sort of laid out flat and all that. So he thought he'd introduce a, you know, a third element into that whole business. Stella wasn't supposed to be a romantic interest, but you could sort of, you could get the idea that if Beatrice was to come in and like, seven or eight or however many games they thought they would make uh, she might see things a little differently and there'd be a little drama going on there which again is kind of kind of odd for like space quests to be honest i mean it was never about get the girl right off into the sunset as a hero uh so so that is it, it's just a corner they painted themselves into sounds good <laughs> all right max wants to know was there anything in the original design docs or plans that never made it into the games? Puzzles, locales, spoofs, etc. Um, I'm kind of drawing a blank on two and two up to five, um, because one of the one of the cool things about Space Quest, in my opinion, is that it's it's the sort of there, there was a a question you sent that why should pay, people play Space Quest, and it's one of those don't think too hard just stream of consciousness just go with what seems cool we'll put it in the game and worry about it later that kind of thing it's almost like jamming like you get a band in a room and you just go okay it, we're, in, we're in a g major uh let's just go and that's what you know the space quest games were um so i uh, i think whatever they thought they would put in the games especially the early games one two and three where it was just like the two guys working on the game scott programming mark drawing the graphics they just you know have a pizza and a beer and go, wouldn't it be cool if we, yeah, of course it would. And then uh, next day it would be in the game kind of thing. And it kind of went a little sideways with four because now they had to storyboard and plan and have a whole team of artists and all that shit. But uh, basically it was just a sort of, let's just do what we want. And and we'll call it a, a quits when someone pokes us and says release date is coming up. That'll be the end of the game. Douglas Adams style, really. Um <laughs> But um, uh, I do know that Space Quest 1 was supposed to have the option to play as either a male or a female main character. You're supposed to be able to pick the gender of the character. Um, of course, this being the 80s, it was a binary gender choice, but still, you got to appreciate the effort at least. Um, that got taken out for, for space considerations. Um, it was uh, it, You'd have to basically double all the animations of the main character and there just wasn't enough room for it. And I know Six had some elements that were cut out. Beatrice was actually supposed to make an appearance at one point, which was left out for whatever reason. Again, the development of Six was just a clusterfuck, so no one really knows what happened. Um, but and, and I don't know the details of the appearance she was supposed to make, but she was supposed to just poke her head in and go, hi, I still exist, and then fuck off somewhere. Um, <laughs> And the uh, uh, most egregiously, the solution to the data quarter puzzle, which everyone assumes is copy protection because the solution is in the manual, uh, was actually supposed to be in game. It was supposed to be on a, a CD you pick up in the apartment of the two kidnappers who kidnap Roger. And, and, and uh, you're supposed to go through their CDs and pop that in. And there's this little comic book, like a digital comic book. And the solution to the data quarter puzzle is like this month's puzzle, you know, Kind of like uh, comic books of uh, of the eighties and stuff. Um, so and 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 the the story goes that they were uh, after Josh had left, Scott Murphy took over 
uh, sort of unwillingly or reluctantly took over um, the the uh, main dude <laughs> role, as it were, uh, and just had to like get this thing out the door. And Josh calls him up like towards the end, like release date is looming a month away or something and and he's just oh oh did you ever get around to the comic book how's the comic book coming along he's like nah we didn't and, you know it's just you know it, that that fell to the floor and he's like what uh, what uh, how are how are people going to know how to solve the data quarter and there's this brief pause over the phone and he's like scott's like oh that's what that was for oh <laughs> and so there's like they just chucked it in the manual because there wasn't time to do anything with it oh. so so i know that uh, but other than that, no, I, I'm not uh, terribly aware of anything that got like left out because, oh, we don't have time and we can't do that. and stuff. Whatever they wanted to do, they just checked it in the game, as far as I know. Excellent things <laughs> to know about. <clears throat> I like that. So no, the, the copy protection was not supposed to be. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Uh, let's see, CGO apps. I've always wondered when it became known that Space Quest IV would be done in VGA and if any of the very early work was done in EGA to start with. Not to my knowledge, no. Uh, Space Quest IV was always going to be VGA because uh, the two guys were, like I said, they wanted it to be state-of-the-art. They wanted it to be futuristic and uh, they wanted the latest tech and the latest every bells and whistles, everything they could put into their game. So it was always supposed to be 256 colors. In fact, there's a there's a story about how Roberta Williams got absolutely pissed off with them because they somehow snuck in color cycling. Like when you go through the time warp, the colors sort of streak past Roger and this it's this uh, method. You can look it up, kids. Uh, color cycling. So um, the thing was back in those days when Sierra introduced new tech, it always went into a King's Quest game first, and then everyone else got to play with it. So VGA, VGA graphics, King's Quest V, uh, CD-ROM, King's Quest V, everything, you know, every uh, music cards, King's Quest IV, all that sort of thing. King's Quest got there first, everyone else gets to play with it afterwards. But Space Quest IV was the first Sierra game that had color cycling, and she did not like that. <laughs> um, but, uh, well, oh, shit, what was the question again? Um, was oh, oh, VGA. No, it was always meant to be VGA, but... It was meant to be a parser game. Uh, in fact, they went quite far into development, as far as I know, uh, where it was still a text parser game. And they were called into Ken Williams's office at one point and asked, do you want to continue with the parser or do you want to switch to our fancy point and click system with uh, we, we introduced with King's Quest V? And there was like, there was no pause. Both Mark and Scott just went, parser, we want a text parser. We love the text parser. We don't like the icons. We want the text parser. And Ken goes, okay. And off they go. A few more weeks of development. Ken calls them back into his office and says, you're doing the icon bar interface. You're doing point and click. And they're like, but no, you're doing point and click. And that's why there's a smell and taste icon in the game. Because that's where some of the jokes, that are the stuff that they couldn't fit, uh, you know, extraneous stuff that wasn't gameplay related. That's where they could shove in all of those little jokes hmm. this is again pretty crummy I, I put myself in their shoes you know <laughs> oh now we have to shift back to this oh oh y'all you have to realize most of this information also comes from scott murphy who at, uh, at times can be a little grumpy but then again he for good he, reason i think he was there when the whole ship absolutely sank hit several icebergs on the way down and uh uh, he understandably feels very shafted by a lot of the decisions that were made. There are also fond memories. Space Quest One was done in a haze of beer and pizza at Ken Williams's house, you know, four in the morning, and then jump in the hot tub kind of thing. It was party days, so there's there's tons of good shit that happened as well. All right, Rift Lurker. I'd be interested to hear if they ever had second thoughts about all those instant deaths, or if. Their inclusion was taken for granted, as was the standard for the day. That's a two, yeah. That's two prong question in a way. The first, this, this is a question I get asked a lot. Actually, the, the unfair deaths and the dead ends and all that stuff. There's a historical context that's very important. There was no game design manual back then. There was no school for game design. Everything you learned was from what had been done previously, and 
Sierra were coming off the heels of text adventures, Infocom, uh, Colossal Cave, all that stuff, where that shit was just expected. It was just, that's how you did that. Uh, these games were brutally unfair, and the reason why they were unfair was because when people bought computer games in the mid to late 80s, there weren't like a million titles on the shelf waiting for you. If you brought home a game, that was not just an investment of money, that was an investment of your time. You wanted to get your money's worth. You wanted to get stuck and you wanted to beat your head against something that seemed very unfair because once you actually solved it, it was like a rush of endorphins that the best sex couldn't provide. It's just that it's it's like amazing fireworks in your head kind of shit. Um, so that's why there are dead ends and and what you might might call unfair puzzles uh, to, to this day. What they did do, however, which I thought was very clever of them, was if you play a game like King's Quest or a police quest or something, you get slapped across the wrist. Like that bad, bad. Even like Police Quest 2 famously has that scowling picture of Jim Walls looking at you, going, he shakes his head and goes, Oh, you poor child. Oh, what a terrible disappointment you are. And and King's Quest was the same. Oh, you fucked up, didn't you? Oh, what a shame. Um, but Space Quest was like, they wanted to make death a reward, not a punishment. You, uh, and, and there is a thing in, in Space Quest circles called death hunting, where you go out of your way to see how you can uh, you know, kill off Roger, because the result is always fantastic. They always put extra little animations in, uh, gory details, funny descriptions. My favorite line of dialogue in any space quest game is if you get eaten by the little mushrooms in space quest 2 there's just a whole wall of text that goes into oh the psychedelic colors and everything it's just let's <laughs> it's a long-winded discussion about these the the di digestive system of these mushrooms and it's just that's just, that's just great so it's a, it's a reward for space quest not a punishment so no i don't think there was any second thoughts what they do regret in hindsight were stuff like the glass shard that's invisible and you know the dead ends and stuff they never wanted to be outright dicks to the player uh it was about having fun having a good time jamming as it were maybe selling some hint books <laughs> yeah, you see that's that's another myth myth uh that yeah they it, had their 1 800 number hotline right they did and they had hint books and they had leaflets for how to order hint books in the game boxes and all that stuff but the myth is that Designers at Sierra were explicitly told to make their games harder so they would sell more hint books. And that's not true. Uh, no one ever told, at least not Scott, uh, Scott, he was never told to make his games more difficult to placate uh, the sales department. Uh, in fact, uh, Al Lowe, when he made Leisure Suit Larry 5, he went the completely opposite direction. He was like, okay, we're not going to have any dead ends. We're not going to have any deaths. There's always a try again. Uh, and it's it, most of the game is just cutscenes on rails. There's no difficult puzzles. But Legion Street Larry 5 is one of the easiest games in the whole Sierra library. So if there was a memo going around saying we need to sell more hint books, it certainly didn't reach Scott or Al. Myth busted. Yeah, I noticed a lot of those. I mean, a lot of the hint books aren't even published by the game studio anyway. So unless they, <laughs> how is that supposed to work? I don't know. I guess maybe they could have had some licensing. Uh, but the fucked up thing is the the hint books for the yeah. early AGI games, the space the Space Quest one and King's Quests one, two, and three, I guess, uh, uh, didn't use the little adventure window, the little transparent, translucent red thing you hold over. Uh, didn't use that. Yeah, I was used... thinking like an Infocom had that, right? The Invisi Clues. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, was, it's not Sierra. Or... Yeah, Sierra. So what did Sierra have? I, I cut you off. I don't know what we were. What's <laughs> <laughs> your thought? I'm babbling. That's... <laughs> that's, that's, uh, uh, I'm I'm the babbler. Uh, so the, the the hint books usually when you look at LucasArts did the same thing. Sierra did the same thing with the VGA games they released in the '90s and such. You get a hint book and the answers are printed inside this little red square that's all garbled, and you're supposed to hold up this little translucent card to reveal the text under the garble. Um, but the first hint books they did, all the hints were written in the sort of disappearing ink, and the hint books came with this little magic marker, this little highlighter pen that you had to scrape across and, and reveal the answer with. The trouble is, and I've got a couple of Space Quest 1 hint books, um, the 
highlighter pen is still there the yellow stuff is still there but the disappearing ink has faded away a long time ago so whatever was on that page is gone forever that's such a weird i mean it's very... fun to be part of that publishing process <laughs> <laughs> i guess not very forward thinking i'd say no no but yeah i was thinking i'd have to i agree strongly with you about a lot of these games too i mean it's so much fun to i mean at first you you die and you get all oh, the Mm. About it. but on the other hand it's funny <laughs> it lets you save at any point in the game even after you're no actually not after you're dead but while it's playing a death animation it'll let you save so it's really i, think I mean far worse than just dying is those getting the game into an unwinnable state yeah see that's talk about that in a lot of these videos that's you shit terrible you messed up until mm, 12 no. hours of gameplay later that is terrible that is objectively terrible and 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 some kind of inexcusable in a way and and they never set out to intentionally do that it was always some sort of oversight like oh oh we thought you'd be able to take the elevator back up to the surface it's like no you forgot to program that in motherfucker (laughs) the alien kiss thing is kind of fun oh god oh i kind of want to spoil that i have a bunch of shit coming up in an upcoming video about uh the alien kissy kissy and the ways you can cheese that and why it's in there and all sorts of shit um you can up the slide spoiler you can totally finish the game and still have an alien embryo inside of you cool. it is actually pos- I, I didn't think it was possible for the longest fucking time and and one dude on my discord even went into the game's code and figured out where exactly does this trigger how long do you have? It all depends on the, what speed the game is running at. How many seconds do you have on any given screen? God damn. I have some weird people on my Discord. <laughs> that is a that is hardcore. They are pretty hardcore. Uh, one of the guys even... Because uh, we went on... Stop me if I'm rambling. Um, we went on this pain train exercise we call it the pain train which is because I'm, I'm kind of infatuated with this old cga palette of cyan magenta black and white that's just categorically objectively hideous but there's just something about it that's a little uh it's a little heartwarming in a way i oh. played commander keen and cga and stuff like that so we were like hey how can we fuck up space quest because you know space quest one two and three support cga and we were kind of having fun with that and we we're like can we can we force Space Quest 4 into CGA? And some, I forget who it was, someone on my Discord figured out that if you play the floppy version of Space Quest 4, that's actually based on an earlier SCI version than the CD version. Um, and particularly if you play the 16 color version of Space Quest 4, yes, there is a 16 color version. That's based on an even earlier version. And that version is compatible with graphics drivers from king's quest 4 so if you take graphics drive from king's quest 4 and plop it into the 16 color version of space quest 4 you can play it in 16 colors unfortunately it will crash every time the screen transitions because that's a little scrolling technique that the cga cards can't work with so what to do well someone on my discord goes in and fucking reverse engineers the graphics driver so it skips the transitions and now we can play the entire game in four (laughs) colors for no goddamn reason whatsoever. This is coming back to that D-Make thing you're talking about. Exactly. That is and cool. and as the icing on the cake, someone else figured out, that was a, a, a dude named Epic Potato Fiend on my Discord, figured out, actually, I don't know if he figured it out, but he went to the trouble of compiling a little uh, uh, assortment of goodies playlist. Someone figured out, at least, that you can transplant audio drivers from different Sierra games into other games. Uh, so the the sound fonts that the different games use are different. Uh, you know, a, a kick drum or a, a bass or whatever will sound different from game to game because you know it's meant to suit whatever game it is. Um, so long story short, if you take the audio drivers from Police Quest Three and chuck it into Space Quest Four, it sounds absolutely hideous, <laughs> gloriously so. <laughs> All right, I'm done. <laughs> All right, I've got one last question here from Jay West. I want to know more about how they got the Super Tramp guy to do the music for three. That's a that's a quick answer. He lived in Oakhurst at the time. He was between tours. 
I think he even reached out to Sierra or a, or he put an ad in the paper or something like a musician board looking for something to do kind of thing. And Sierra went, why don't you compose for one of our games? And there's like, and he was like, okay, what do you got? And well, we're doing this game called Space Quest. You ever heard of it? No. Uh, would you like to compose the music for it? Sure. And they sent a VHS tape to him of the of the intro sequence, and off he went. They, they lent him an MT32 and some sequencing stuff, and he'd never used the sequencer before. But he was like, "Okay, sure, I'll give it a go." And off he got. Uh, off he went, and he turned in a fantastic soundtrack. Wow. That was it. He was bored. He was between tours. Well, I think. And we... there's there's actually an interview with him on my channel. Plug, yay, algorithm, uh, a a long ass time ago i somehow got in contact with him and i uh emailed him a bunch of questions and i had a po i had a podcast at the time and i asked him bob yep interview with bob siebenberg uh siebenberg, it's an sorry siebenberg that took me a while too That's uh, from super Trek. yep and he uh, it was for a podcast i had at the time the space quest historian podcast so it's audio only uh, but I did email him and uh, had a list of questions and he recorded his questions with a microphone type thing. And uh, after the podcast sort of faded into obscurity, thank God, um, I resurrected the interview because he's you know, it's Bob fucking Siepenberg and I put it on my YouTube channel. So and he tells the story of how he got hired. I'm missing out on a few details. Memory is not what it all was. So, But he has it in there. Now these uh, we could go to yeah you got it here on YouTube people can watch music of Space Quest three yeah, we can plug I, their channel Space Quest is story <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember very well I have it on my channel yeah I'm the same way I've got interviews with people and I don't remember that I interviewed them jeez <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> all right well thanks for all this time. Um, uh, my pleasure story. i am um i gotta say i am i am both uh thrilled and a little surprised that i somehow ended up on your interview uh series because um matt chats are famous in the adventure game community it's like uh it's like if you get on the letterman show or something back oh. when he was the thing it's, it has the pinnacle so uh the entire time i've been walking or walking around all day trying to think of pithy jokes or something and the only one i could come up with was uh thank you for choosing me to devalue your brand <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> you got like a, a severe modesty because they're worried for like somebody who's like psychopathically modest <laughs> it's, not, it's, not mod it's 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 it, honestly it's oh, it's one of those things you know but it, one thing i like you know I, the space quest is story and i i thought that is a good name you know it's precise people know what it is you know it, it's good branding <laughs> it's a i i, I chat, what is that who's mad what chat you know it's not it rhymes at least and it uh, and it does space rhyme. Quest, <laughs> and space quest historian kind of painted me into a corner honestly when i started a youtube channel i didn't think twice about it again shits and giggles i mean matt chat's like the first thing that popped into mind i'm like i need to come up it's like you're trying to do your you know, register for YouTube, and it's like, what's the name of your channel? Uh, Matcha. You know. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorite YouTubers is Tech Moan because uh, he thought he'd have a combination of technology videos and just him pissing and moaning. So he became Tech Moan, and he sort of cut out the pissing and moaning part and just became focused on tech. But you know, the YouTube handle was registered, so well, hey, off you go. But no, uh, when I the whole Space Quest historian thing is first of all self-bestowed title so i was an arrogant little shit when i was 16 years old and i came up with this again this is something to do with jess uh and his first space quest fan side the the virtual broom closet way back in 95 96 i wrote because this was before wikipedia so i wrote the space quest faq long ass text document of everything you needed to know about space quest at the time and because I was such an arrogant little shithead, I just said, oh, well, now I've, I've got all this information. I must be like a historian of some kind. So now I'm the Space Quest historian. And later on comes YouTube. And I'm like, okay, I'll just 
put in Space Quest Historian because I'm just going to make a video about Skaterama when I'm drunk and call it a day, really. And then I start getting into Let's Plays and I start playing other games and they're like, but this has nothing to do with Space Quest. So it's actually terrible branding. It's a complete paint, a corner painting exercise. So Living. fuck it. <laughs> well, would you change your name to something else? I mean, have you had other? I've thought about it a lot, uh, but... Honestly, every every time someone mentions me online, when that happens, it's always oh, and, and the Space Quest historian. Did this, so it's kind of stuck. It's like Lazy Game Reviews rebranded as LGR, and I don't know if that cost him any subscribers or whatever, or or a, a branding or whatever. I've 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 considered rebranding myself the way he did to just SQH, but it just doesn't roll off the tongue. And yeah, it's not. You know, screw it. <laughs> It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. But, but history involved in that too. But thank you so much for for having me on your show. It's a great oh. honor. And apologies for babbling. <laughs> no, not at all. People love. I mean, we call it babbling. People love to listen to people talk about their favorite, you know, games and stuff. I mean, who doesn't? This, <laughs> this this is me holding myself back because this this could go on for hours and hours. <laughs> Yeah, let's get lost in all your videos. I mean, you got Phantasmagoria here. Okay, <laughs> we, we could talk all day long, but I know you got stuff to do. Uh, oh, thanks this... again, uh, folks. Go check it out, Space Quest Historian. Uh, it's on YouTube. Yeah, it is on YouTube uh, and are there other places too. Do you have a? Well, I was gonna, I was gonna plug uh, my band because uh, my band Era Forty Seven, named after a catastrophic crash in Space Quest Six. Um, is is about to put out a a record of uh, music from the seventh guest and the eleventh hour, called Soups On, uh, and we actually got the Fat Man's uh, uh, George Sanger. Sorry, he he's called the Fat Man. He made the music for oh, those I two know. games. We got oh. his permission. Yeah, he's a, a fantastic dude. Yeah, there it is. Uh, we cra- we crowdfunded a vinyl release of it. That's we just handed in the master. It's going off to press. It's going to be on four goddamn LPs. <laughs> um, and and yeah, we've we've had tons of fun with that one, and it's got some surprises on it. That um, yeah, it's it's got new stuff on it that you've never heard before, and it's we got most of the same. Death yeah. song or Mister Dead or something like that. Yeah, we got that one, and uh, that one has a couple of surprises on it too. I I don't think I'm spoiling anything in particular here, but um, the original Mister Death that plays in the game has this weird German accent and it was a, it was a joke band that the fat man started just with himself. And Rob Landeros of Trilobite was so enamored with it that he said, oh, can't you just give me one of those German language tunes you've been kicking around? Why? Cause I, I, I kind of want to put it in the game. It's like, okay, here, here, have one of these. And he put it in the fucking main menu. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we got that in and we actually got, the fat man himself playing guitar and singing backup vocals on our version of Mr. Death. Oh, wow. And that's not the most exciting surprise we have either. Uh, the other one, see, I, I really want to spoil one of them, which is the biggest surprise, but I can't because we haven't told our backers about it yet. Um, but the other one, which we have told about, uh, talked about is the, uh, the song, the final hour, which is the, the main theme from the 11th hour. Um, there's a little voicemail like a little haunted answering machine that says uh, uh you've reached the madman in me there's no one at the house at the moment but leave a message and something like that um and we didn't know who did the original voice for that and we were like okay we need someone to record this and it turns out that george sanger's daughter gwen is actually a backer of soups on our, our little project here and she's been leaving us some very nice comments so we at and this is where it gets kind of creepy so we email her and say, how would you like to do that answering machine and not tell your dad? <laughs> we want it to be a surprise for him when he hears the song for the first time. And she went, yeah, let's do it. So she did it and we put it in the song. And then we sent the song to the fat man and said, could you please video yourself listening to the song for the first time? There's a little surprise for you in there. Okay. And there's this lovely shot of him just going, when he hears his daughter for the first time on it. It's brilliant. Yeah, I love him. He's got a great uh, book. You ever read his book? Um, oh, the Fat Man's book? 
Yeah, I can't remember that. It's got a picture of him on the cover with his cowboy outfit, outfit and everything. It's a, oh, I should. I, the name. It's, a, it's a real hoot. Oh, I really have. No, no, I haven't. I should. He's been nothing but nice to us and, and just super supportive throughout the whole thing. So I, 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 I would say I owe it to him to at least read his book. <laughs> yeah, this the fat man on Game Audio. Oh, yes. Tasty morsels of sonic goodness. It's really funny. Damn, I got to get that. Absolutely. Guys, he's just so amazingly talented. Oh, he is. Oh, and his name is all, he's not just a great composer. And he is. He's not just a great composer. He also is behind all of those uh, MIDI timbers for uh, AdLib and Sound Blaster FM cards back in the day. Um, you know, of everything from uh, everything, everything that had the Miles uh, sound audio sound test kind of thing. He 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 worked with the um, uh, with uh, was it was it Roland? I think yeah. Uh, or the the MIDI Corporation, whatever the fuck it. He, he, we actually did an interview with him on on our Era Forty Seven YouTube channel where he tells the whole story. But anyway, he got in deep, uh, actually providing sound patches, sound libraries for people who wanted to use FM cards and couldn't afford the big MT thirty two sound canvas and stuff like that. So yeah, his his legacy is not just confined to being an awesome composer. He's also responsible for most of the joyous memories we have of FM soundtracks from the nineties. Yeah, he talks a lot about his uh, putt putt goes to the bus or whatever. And that little kid's yep. apparently there's that's the first ever music video in a game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one of yeah, those. he did, did amazing stuff. <laughs> and he and he's been so kind. He even let us like because he has the rights to the seventh guest and eleventh hour music. Um, uh, he owns the rights to that. And when I asked him, "Can we do your music?" Uh, we sort of talked back and forth and he was like, mm, you know what? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I was like, do we need to buy any licensing? He says, no, no, I trust you. You seem to do okay stuff. We've done like, Gabriel Knight uh, and Duke Nukem 3D <laughs> uh, uh, before that as as the band, as Era 47. And he had to listen to that. He's like, yeah, okay, yeah. You can, you can go ahead and do your thing. Uh, what he didn't know was that we were going to throw heavy guitars and stuff all over it. He, he thought he thought we were going to do like a dance remix kind of thing, which is kind of what we did with Gabriel Knight and, and Duke Nukem 3D. But no, we, we went full 90s industrial rock on this one. We thought, hey, wouldn't it be fun if Typo Negative performed The Seventh Guest? Said, yeah, let's do it. That's a good hook. Hey, have a listen to it. Uh, we're, we're uncharacteristically proud of this one, mainly because I just played the drums. Uh, some okay. someone someone talented actually played guitars and stuff like that. We actually got a real violin player as well. Yeah, Eric, the same dude who's doing the King's Quest Six uh, record, he plays violin on the Seventh Guest record. Classically trained and everything. It's actually it's a real violin. I should I just get the uh, MP3 or get the full vinyl? Uh you're gonna have trouble with the full vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll set one aside for I know you. What you're gonna say? Come on. Uh, I don't get the CD version. What do we? I'd have to figure out what this uh, what this translates. Uh, uh, well, we'll talk later. We'll we'll figure something out. Um, like I said, the album is done. Uh, we're just holding off releasing it until our backers get yeah, their thing. I I really love these uh, the seventh guest and eleventh hour. They are fun. I uh, I had the Grand Divine on way back. Yes. Yes. He's a really fun guy too. Really good. Royalty. Yeah. Absolute royalty. Oh, sure, sure he is. Yep. He even fished out the uh, original <laughs> cowboy hat. Of yeah. he did. <laughs> oh man. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's yep. Yeah, that's enough plugging right. from me. <laughs> oh, thanks again. Yeah, definitely uh, people check out the channel, check out the record. I'll put all this on the uh in in the uh, what do you call it? Video description. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, let's get back to it. Thanks again. Talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. You're a champion. Thank you. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> I mean, you see what I mean? What a cool dude. And that was a really fun chat. I hope a, 
uh, maybe have him back on at some point. You know, if I ever get to Denmark, I always, you know, when I have guests on, you know, there's certain ones, you know, a lot, of, a lot of my guests, I'm like, well, I have, you know, infinite respect. I'm not worthy, you know, I'm honored to have you on and so on and so forth. But, you know, I, I can't say that I would want to kick back in a tavern with every guest and, you know, down a few pints. But uh, uh, I think Space Quest Historian is one of those I'd put on that uh, special list. It'd be uh, kind of fun if I'm ever in Denmark. Maybe I'll look him up if that ever happens. <laughs> We'll see. Uh, but as always, I want to thank you very, very much. Yes, Matt, Qu <laughs> Matt Chat Tavern Edition. <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much for supporting this show, keeping this show on the air. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow, infinite gratitude. Uh, you have no idea how much it means to me. It's really cool to be able to do this. Uh, now, we are coming up. Actually, we're not coming up. We are past. <laughs> The 15th, uh, you know, I need another hand here. Uh, 15 years of Mad Chat, folks. 15 years. I know that thanks to Matt Workla, <laughs> one of the best uh, Matt Chatters around. Uh, so, uh, I thought in honor of that, I have uh, 10, T-E-N, or T-I-N, if you're like me from the southern part of the U.S., <laughs> Mad Chat tokens, yes, coins, solid go well <laughs> not really <laughs> uh, but I, whatever this is made of it's it's heavy and i think the uh, you know given inflation it's probably worth more <laughs> every day <laughs> it's it's good solid currency uh, anyway i have 10 of these left with this nifty little coin baggie yes look at this even got a little string on it so you can really you know clench it tight <laughs> uh, anyway what I, I thought would be fun with those uh, i don't want them just sitting here here in the Mad Cave, you know, as much fun as I like to kind of run my fingers through them occasionally. I want you to have one. Uh, so if you're a supporter of the show and you don't have a coin already, uh, just uh, message me through Patreon. Say you want a coin. Uh, give me the mailing address. Uh, now, if you're if you're overseas and this is going to be like a huge expense, uh, we might need to figure that part out. <laughs> but, uh, but I'd sure like for you to have one of these. Uh, so anyway, just shoot me a line uh, through the Patreon. Tell me you want a coin and uh, give me your address, and I'll see what I can do. Uh, but I think it'd be fun. Good way to celebrate the, uh, the 15 years of Match Chat. Now, if you want to support the show, uh, there's lots of ways to do that. You support it by watching it. <laughs> but you can also comment, uh, liking it, and apparently there's a little bell thing. Uh, I don't normally like to get into this kind of minutiae, but apparently YouTube is like a huge deal. Uh, so if you want to get notifications when new shows uh, come out, uh, look for that little bell icon, little bell button. Uh, click on that. Tell it you want to be notified when new Matt Chat shows air. Uh, apparently, that works the YouTube magic. <laughs> so be good for you and good for me. Uh, but most importantly, if you really like the show, uh, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page. Become a Ratron. Get access to the awesome Discord. All kinds of fun stuff. Come on, you know you want to! <laughs> so come on in. <laughs> come to the dungeon, yes. You know, one of these days, if I ever make it rich, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a, a, a dungeon. And I have a little tavern on top. And, you know, every now and then, <laughs> we have enough ruse, we'll go down into the dungeon and fight some real-life uh, rat. Uh, giant rats down there. It's going to be fun. Uh, anyway, where was I? <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, why don't we do that uh, news from the Mad Cave? <laughs> Thinking about dungeons and taverns and, and rats to fight. With, you know, who, it's like uh, things you can go and throw axes. You know, axe uh, axe throwing uh, parlors seem to be a thing. But I always thought the the missing link there is a rat on the other end. So you're not just throwing these axes at a target. You know, give them like a giant rat. To, I would pay for that. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, Matt Workula, speak of the devil. Uh, he writes in about a Masters of Realm Master, sorry, <laughs> Master of Realms Kickstarter. Uh, it's got about a month left, 29 days, as I wrote this, but I think it's ticked down to 28 days because stuff. A revolutionary tabletop 3D map making. Detailed 2D, 3D printed maps and VTT integration for extraordinary adventures. What the heck is VTT? <laughs> VTT, what is that? I don't know, you tell me. It's apparently important. Our goal is to offer an extensive range of tile sets 
to support map creators in reaching their objectives. What the, you know, maybe I could use this to plan my uh, dungeon uh, floor layout. Yeah. Yeah. See, whether they are crafting 2D maps, preparing for 3D printing, uh, or utilizing their favorite VTT platform. <laughs> what is this V? What the heck is VTT? I feel like I'm an ignoramus here. I don't know. Tell me what VTT means. Uh, our big dream is to incorporate generative AI, like ChatGPT, into our Master of Realms application. So, yeah, how you like that? All right, uh, moving on. Golden Drake writes in about subterrain, Mines of Titan. Awaken from an abandoned stasis pod and discover a doomed mining camp on Titan in an uncompromised turn-based survival RPG. Survive the evolving horrors that lurk below and craft equipment, research new gear, fight against overwhelming odds, or even discover your true fate. Help surviving colonists assign jobs, harvest, organize stations, keep the doom at bay. Manage food and water. <laughs> Keep tabs on oxygen. <laughs> Do they go to the bathroom? Uh, treat any sustained injuries, all while penetrating the abandoned mining tunnels beneath the surface. I think I'll make a game like this one day, and it's like 100% <laughs> realistic. <laughs> so like when when they sleep, they really you have to shut the game off for eight hours and come back. <laughs> uh, currently, it's 10% off on Steam, uh, $17.99, so check that out. Once again, Subterrain Mines of Titan looks pretty cool. Thank you, Golden Drake. And then uh, last, but certainly, certainly not least, is Miko back with Outcast, A New Beginning. And they're calling this thing a requel. Yes, uh, it's not a sequel. It's not a trequel. <laughs> it's not a, a requel. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go with that. Explore the breathtaking. Alien world of Adelpha. Support the local talons in their struggles and fight your way through fast-paced battles against invading robots in this third-person open-world action-adventure sequel to the 1999 cult classic. You know, Miko also posts a nice review of this, uh, so you can see what, what the deal is with this requel. You know, from what I gather, the original game was, was pretty cool, but it had some problems, uh, but they have addressed all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, arguably, uh, have improved vastly on that original experience. So they're, they're trying to please, I guess, the people going for nostalgia uh, versus new players. But it looks pretty cool. Uh, so check it out. Let me know what you think. That's, once again, Outcast, A New Beginning. The Requel. <laughs> Maybe then we can make a Requel. <laughs> Matt Schrath, The Requel. Uh, okay, is that all for the news? I think so. What about that Ale of the Week? Uh, what about that? Ale of the Week, man. We have an Ale of the... Oh, yes, we have an Ale of the Week. Now, you're going to like this one. Uh, this is a th Athletic, which, you know, I kind of have been, in snobbish fashion, <laughs> bypassing this Athletic uh, Brewing Company, because uh, I see these all over the place. It's like one of the most, one of the more uh, popular, I guess, and common uh, non-alcoholic beers out there, but, man, that was stupid. <laughs> these, are, uh, these are like... I've been consistently impressed with these. I'm going to be trying the uh, Run Wild IPA here uh, on the show today. Uh, so it is a non-alcoholic brew. Uh, they tell you it's got 65 calories in it, which that makes me wonder, you know, what does a regular beer have calorie-wise? Uh, I don't know. Probably more than that, I guess. Uh, all athletic, at Athletic Brewing Company, we are pioneering a craft brew revolution. We believe you shouldn't have to sacrifice your ability to be at your best to enjoy craft brew. So we crafted our innovative lineup of refreshing non-alcoholic craft brews. See, where are these guys from? They say, where are they from? Milford, Connecticut, apparently. They also list San Diego, California. <laughs> so, uh, so one of those. Oh, what's it say here? So they give back up to $2 million annually to restore local trails. That's pretty cool. Yes, yeah, so I really like the I like the uh, the marketing on this. So it's you know it's like if you're uh, drinking this, it's because you want to preserve that athletic physique. <laughs> you know, pounding these in the gym, I guess. Uh, uh, that's pretty cool. I guess you know it kind of makes sense why they have that trail on there. As you're kind of hiking uh, with the athletic brewing companies, hydrating instead of dehydrating on the trail. 
Uh, anyway, let's pour this uh, sucker into my glass here. Of course, I have my drinking horn on standby. My drinking horn is thirsty. All right, let's pour a little bit of it into the glass first, though, so you can see the brew. Oh, look at the color. Nice, really nice golden color on this. Good head. Lots of bubbly bubblies. I got all those bubbles. <laughs> you know, I... I I used to not think the uh, carbonation was that big of a thing, but if, if you tried some that are kind of flat, uh, you know how big of a deal that is. You want something really active, uh, something exciting. It's, I think they call that the mouth fuel uh, factor, uh, but I find it makes a pretty big difference. Wow, great uh, hoppy aroma on this. <sighs> I mean, this would make a great air freshener. This would be a good cologne. You know, it's very hoppy. Uh, of course, there's no alcohol fumes coming off of this. I'd be kind of worried if there was some funky uh, uh, alcohol uh, odor on this. Of course not. Uh, it just smells really good. Kind of citrusy uh, aroma. If you probably used uh, some citrusy hops. Uh, let's put some on the drinking horn, too. Oh, come here, you. Rather excellent drinking horn. I'm not going to forget the drinking horn, folks. No way. You have a drinking horn like this, you got to feed it. <laughs> oh, it smells pretty good in the horn, too. Okay, let's give it a give it a taste, see if it tastes as good as it smells. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, now this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. Let me try it again. Hmm. Man, these guys have nailed it. That is absolutely an IPA. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't taste any like non-alcoholic. <laughs> you know, you're not compromising any flavor uh, with this at all. Doesn't taste watery. Uh, it's got a good a uh, hoppy flavor. Tastes just, you know, like any other IPA, but one of the better IPAs at that. Let me try it from the glass. Yeah, again, just, <laughs> you know, I've just been so impressed with this athletic uh, uh, brewing company. At least it's a uh, run wild. I've got a couple of their other flavors, too. Uh, but you remember when I started this little... Uh, non-alcoholic series. I said what I was looking for was a, uh, a non-alcoholic beer that didn't taste different, you know, it didn't make you feel like, uh, it's not bad for a non-alcoholic, you know. No, 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 no. I want something that's, that's just as good, you know, as the as a regular IPA, something you could really enjoy drinking, uh, that you wouldn't even know it was non-alcoholic unless you just happened to see the can or, you know, somebody told you. And this is ugh, damn near perfect, in my opinion. Let me try it again. Yeah, yeah, just super good. You know, you could drink this no problem. <laughs> uh, again, you can forget even that it's a, a non-alcoholic and just enjoy the uh, the IPA flavor. Basically, if you like IPAs, I don't know why you wouldn't like this. Uh, really good. It's good body, <laughs> uh, good head on it, good flavor, good uh, aroma. And the best part of this is. You could chug, you know, three or four of these. <laughs> I guess you could chug a whole six-pack if you want uh, and not have any performance issues. <laughs> so, and so there you go. Really, I'm uh, really happy with this one. Uh, I think I'd go, uh, you know, as far as non-alcoholic beers go, I have to go full five out of five on this. Uh, you know, if I'm going to compare it to all beer, all IPAs, I might. Uh, you know, there's, that's, that's tough, you know, because there's just... There's a whole universe out there of a fantastic brew, so I might knock it down to four out of five you know, if we're going to do that. But uh, man, I just got to say, as far as non-alcoholics go, you can't go wrong with this. You, you really got to try this out. I really think you'd enjoy this. I want to get some uh, second opinions on it. And it is pretty common, uh, at least it's pretty commonly available. So if you happen to run across this athletic uh, run wild, uh, pick up a six pack of it. You know, if you like beer, <laughs> try it uh, and let me know what you think. Uh, but I really think they, uh, they're on to something there. Uh, big plus. All right, let's wrap it up with a quotation. 
and I've been, I got the uh, Conan, uh, I think it's called Conan, oh crap, <laughs> I don't remember the name, uh, but they've uh, got this nice uh, collector's edition of the Blu-rays that came out recently, and it comes with all sorts of cool stuff, it even comes with a couple of uh, uh, posters, here's one of Arnold, you know, they're double-sided posters, I mean, it's just a <laughs> pretty awesome deal, <laughs> that's a uh, little book with some trivia, uh, the history of Conan. Uh, but anyway, it got me wanting to uh, see if there was any good quotes by Dino De Laurentiis. And of course, it's just ex as you would expect, there's quite a few. To me, the only real star of the movie is the writer. And I work with writers very closely, from outline to first draft and on to the seventh draft, whatever it takes. Then my job is to support the director to make the best movie we can. Some producers try to go past them, but my job is to support them. So some words of wisdom there from Dino. <laughs> anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.